Well, welcome back. It is Wednesday, February 28th. I'm here with the man. <laughs> the myth. The man. The, the man, the myth, the legend in his own mind. <laughs> Steve Altry, pastor at Denver United Methodist Church. And this is Paul Thompson, and he is still your pastor at Huntersville <laughs> United Methodist Church. Don't remind them. They've tried to forget about that. Well, there's still uh, at least four of them are still tuning in, so yeah, we've got to I'll, give us our best. we got we got uh, singles and singles of followers, don't we? We are something else. So today we're picking back up with Mark chapter 11, verse 46. Now, it, I think the location matters here. Um, so Jesus is in Jericho. Now, if you remember, Jericho is the place where Joshua leads the people out of the wilderness, mm-hmm. across the River Jordan, which is parted similar to the Red Sea. Uh, first town that is conquered. Uh, and Said to be maybe the oldest city in the world. And it is also a place that is at one of the, close to one of the lowest places points geographically on the planet mm-hmm. because it's that's just it is just north of the red of the dead sea which means it is far below it is so far down in in the in a hole and you literally when you hear that they went up to Jerusalem you you have to go up to get to Jerusalem so in this historic place Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem and that road from Jerusalem from Jericho to Jerusalem is one of the more dangerous roads anyone could mm-hmm. ever travel because it, it's dicey at best. Uh, and so that's kind of the place where in this low point of the earth that this blind man named Mark Bartimaeus um, approaches Jesus. Yeah, so again, Bar, in, in, in verse 46, it, it actually says it. It says that uh, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth he began to shout and say Jesus son of David have mercy on me what's that uh, reference point Steve son of David it's a way to denote uh, the Messiah yeah right that you are the one who's come in the in the vein of David in the tradition of David in the the way of David you you are it, it's a way of saying I see you as the Messiah which is where the irony comes yeah and Mm -hmm. and so he begins to shout out and they're all telling him all the rest of the crowd man don't shut up Mm -hmm. that we can't jesus can't be bothered with you this figure that they had some level of respect for i guess uh shut up don't 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 bother him but he 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 understands this may be his one best Mm -hmm. shot Mm -hmm. and so he begins to crowd even louder jesus son of david have mercy on me jesus calls the man and tells him, calls him over and says, call him here. And uh, they call the blind man, hey, take heart, get, get up. He's calling you, throwing off his cloak, which I think is a, a, a real subtle reference point here, throwing off his cloak. He sprang up, came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? What do you think the cloak? What? <laughs> I, I think it is this... this uh, connection between healing and and faith between a recognition that oftentimes it is grief it is shame it is the the hard things that we've experienced in life that have beaten us down like a cloak well and also as a blind man he would not have had much that he owned and the cloak would have been his he may have been where he slept every night And and recognize that still in this society, they believe that uh, blindness or something like that was a sign of God's disfavor, Mm -hmm. that uh, certainly God was punishing somebody because of that, you know, the born blind. That's a pretty familiar theme in the scriptures. They still had this Deuteronomic theology that if you were rich, if you were wealthy, if uh, your health was good, then God was for you. And then conversely. If you had something wrong with you, it's because somebody had sinned along the way. Well, and and I think by Bartimaeus proclaiming him as son of David, um, he does come. He asks, you know, Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And, and, like, well, and I think that question is uh, uh, so hilarious on, on the surface, and yet exactly the question that we all have to ask. I did a, a thing with the men's Bible study the other day that I had read. And I said, all right, I want you to write down, what do you want Jesus to do for you? Hmm. 
and most of us start off and we think, okay, I want, um, I want to be forgiven, I want peace, I list anxiety, those kind of things. And then I said, do it again. What do you really want Jesus to do for you? And then you begin to mark out some things, add a few things, and then we do it a third time. And in the end, what you recognize is Jesus has probably done for us everything that we need already. All we need to do is apply them. Hmm. All we need to do is recognize we are we're already forgiven. We're already blessed. We need not live in anxiety and worry, concern. That's what makes you the great teacher you are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'll put you under my tutelage here and, and, and help you. Uh, well, I mean, that that's a great point. Um, I also think it, it points to, surely Jesus knew what Bartimaeus wanted, but the fact that he asked means, you know, that on one level, certainly God knows what we need. And it, and um, Jesus even says that God knows what you need before. But, but to go through the exercise of asking is an important thing here, evidently, to, to say exactly, be specific in what you pray for. Uh, and I think specific, Specificity, and I can't it's say It's easy for you to say. Yeah, is is important in how we pray. Uh, that it's an aspect of of you know, oh, it it takes from the general to the specific, and that's that's a good thing in our prayer life. And so he he names that, and he receives what he asks for. And so many times we don't we don't name the things we need. I, I've quit praying, Lord, that 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 uh, we ask for Your presence in our in in this church or whatever we're doing. No, I don't need to pray for that. I need to pray that we might we might come to see it. Yeah, recognize the presence already here. The yeah, presence is already here. So but I think that's a it, critical thing. Jesus says to the man, "What do you want me to do for you? Uh, I need to see." And it also comes back to this theme that we see in Mark from the very beginning. Who who sees Jesus for who he is, he is it, it's not the ones who you would think would recognize Jesus. It's always, well, it's the demons, right? Mm-hmm. It's the prince, powers and principalities that identify Jesus. And now here, a blind person sees who Jesus is. And as we look right before that, James and John don't see who Jesus is or the other disciples. But the the outsider, the one who shouldn't have access to this knowledge, has access to this knowledge. And I love that final line. Jesus says, go, your faith has made you well. In other words, even if he had regained, or even if he'd stayed blind, the, the awareness of being able to see Jesus for who he really it, is, is the whole point. And he immediately regained his sight. And But here's what another thing that's interesting about Bartimaeus is he followed him on the way. Yeah. He doesn't stay in Jericho, he doesn't um, doesn't run home to show whoever may be whatever family he may have. He has a someone he's he now he goes. So they're on the way from Jericho, not a long trek from Jericho now as we head into Jerusalem. And I want you to recognize here we are, we are entering the last week of Jesus's life, starting at chapter eleven. We're in we're in Jerusalem on that. Sunday before Jesus dies on Friday. And uh, so much of what Mark writes about happens in the last week of Jesus' life. Um, we'll talk in just a minute. We'll probably not get all the way through it today, but about this entrance into Jerusalem. What What's so fascinating, Steve? You remember uh, Beth Fagi and Beth Bethany near the Mount of Olives? Um, ge- geographically, where is that? So it's just right outside of town. It's it's a good couple of stones throws. It's like a suburb. Yeah, <laughs> it's just an outline, and not even an outline suburb. It's like the uh, it's right right next to the city, and uh, you have to, and it's on a little bit of a rise, so you have to go down through a little valley and then back up um, to, in order to come into Jerusalem. But it it's a uh, again, it, it's certainly a bedroom community for Jerusalem and. That's where he is when he starts to walk into um, into Jerusalem. And, and from what I remember, isn't it approaching? Wouldn't it be approaching from the east? Yeah, uh, the eastern gate. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, and it also comes down uh, the Mount of Olives. This trek would come down through the basically the community cemetery. Yeah, um, coming down through there where. 
uh, other gospels record that uh, that they put actually put pebbles on the tombstones. They're all facing the eastern gate, and, and the idea is that when you went to visit a dead relative, you'd put a pebble. It's probably that's what Jesus refers to. This is not in Mark's gospel when it says, "If if I told them to be quiet, then the very stones would cry out." It's probably those pebbles he's talking. But it's about. an interesting view because there are there are tombs there that have been uh, that are hundreds and hundreds of years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I mean, even in Jesus's day, they would have been hundreds of years old. Now, in our day, they're thousands of years old. And they they don't bury people the way we bury people. These are tombs that are up on top of the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, the the part of the rocks, the stones, is you didn't put flowers on graves. That's but there was it's similar to what we do when we put flowers on graves. Mm-hmm. So Jesus is coming into Jerusalem through the cemetery. Um, and I think we'll we'll take up that story tomorrow. We'll pick up uh, tomorrow in Jerusalem.